<laughs> Sounds vaguely threatening, but yeah. I'm not looking forward to hearing about it. You're all very far back. <laughs> Sci-fi, that's scary. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thanks to Penny and Florence for organising this. I can't believe it's a whole day-long session. That's fantastic. Um, and for accepting what is, I admit, quite a weirdly uh, worded title. Um, I'll get to what the title is a bit later, but um, I'm glad to see that I wasn't the only person that went a bit strange with this. <laughs> and I have changed it slightly to Archaeology, Memory and the Post-Apocalyptic Museum, because as I was writing it, I realised that memory is a much, much richer term to work with than heritage in this kind of way. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is something that's kind of an offshoot of an offshoot of research that I'm currently doing into the implications of post-humanist thinking for the heritage field. So this is my postdoc at the moment. And in this wider project, what I'm uh, chiefly looking at is issues of inheritance in the age of the Anthropocene, how we might take on and pass down differently and rethink notions of value and legacy in relation to the non-human. So that comes in a little bit to what I'm going to talk about today, but this talk emerges more directly from a project I'm currently designing with a scholar of sci-fi at Birkbeck University, uh, Dr. Caroline Edwards. And this project is looking at speculative archaeologies, as we've been defining it, uh, which is the act of looking forward to look back and consider the present as the deep historical past. So this is obviously a very common trope in art and literature over the past 250 years. And we've identified about 60 examples in total from um, the ruins of empires from, I think, 1789 or something like that, all the way up to Will Self's The Book of Dave. And there's a huge variety in between there. Um, and I always like putting up a slide that has the arcades project alongside Motel of the Mysteries, <laughs> which I think have probably never been paired together before. Um, but it's also very much a, a current idea. Um, Mark Curry has uh, written in his book about time that we seem to be living through a moment when, and I quote, an anticipatory mode of being is characteristic of contemporary culture. And I think this came up in um, Gavin's talk last night. As Curry goes on, the future anterior or future perfect is often invoked as a tense of our times, a tense definitive of an epochal temporality, some distinctively contemporary experience or understanding of time. So that's Mark Curry writing in 2006, and I think that's still very much present today. So hopefully this is what my next postdoc is going to be about, uh, looking both at the history of this kind of trope and idea but also the potentiality of speculative archaeological thinking. Uh, and this is just three very recent examples that um, have kind of spurred my thinking in this area. Azra Aksamiya's project Future Heritage Collection, where she works with people to identify what will be, she kind of acts as this archaeologist of the future, asking people to identify what will be important to them. Uh, Larissa Sansor's work, they, In the Future They Ate from the Finest Porcelain, which is all about the Israel-Palestine conflict and what uh, objects mean in that kind of context. And then Fictilis's recent Museum of Capitalism, which opened in Oakland at the end uh, a, a couple of months ago, where they, take, uh, they kind of look forward and, and imagine that capitalism has ended and what of capitalism will we want to display in the museum. So the two case studies that I want to talk about today have been hugely inspirational for um, helping me to think through these ideas. They've uh, stayed with me for a very long time. So I think I first saw Le Jeté. Uh, I should apologise to any French speakers for how much I butcher the language in this talk, because I don't speak French, but uh, I'll, try and, I'll try and put it into my own words. Um, Le Jeté I saw about 15 years ago at the BFI, before another film that I'd gone along to see, and this is uh, a kind of short film, and it just hit me like a brick wall, and it's stayed with me ever since, and it has been one of my great obsessions, which I'm now kind of looking to explore academically, which is fantastic. Um, it's from 19... Has anyone seen it? Okay, brilliant. So it's from 1962, and it is a 28-minute film um, of a man living in the ruins of Paris after World War III, who is sent back in time through the power of his memories to try and save humanity. So it's told almost entirely in still images. The vast majority of the film is photographs rather than film itself, and voiceover narration rather than dialogue. The second um, case study is from 2007, 
by French graphic novelist Nicolas de Cressy. Uh, this was the first in a series, has anyone read this? This is absolutely brilliant. I hope everyone goes out and buys this after this talk. Uh, so this was the first in a series of graphic novels commissioned by the Louvre. Um, I think there's about eight now. The aim being to create a lasting bridge between the museum and the world of comics and their readers, which I think is a fantastic initiative. And I, and I want to bring these two into dialogue here to think through issues of fragmentation, interpretation, memory, and the role of the museum after the end of the world, as it were. Um, I should say from the outset that there's a vast imbalance in scholarship about these two texts. So Legete has been written about, picked apart, analysed over the past 40 years. It's been remade as 12 Monkeys. It's actually a remake of Legete. Um, whereas there's barely anything written about glacial period so far. But I think we might see to, uh, start to see that in the next few years. Um, a little bit on the creators of these works. So Chris Marker, uh, who's on the left with Alain René, um, they actually worked on a film together called All Statues Must Die, which I've yet to see, but sounds fantastic. Um, so Chris Marker was a French experimental filmmaker who returned time and again to themes of memory and temporality throughout his career. And he actually described the word career as despicable which I like. So he had no real concept of that he was doing some kind of oeuvre, but uh, he, he certainly did work with these themes all the time. He also was, uh, he travelled the world constantly, making documentaries in Japan, Cuba, Indonesia and China, aiming to, and I think this is really important in his words, capture life in the process of becoming history. So apart from Le Jeté, uh, Marker is perhaps best known for his essay travel log Sans Soleil of 1982, and his labyrinthine, partly autobiographical CD-ROM, which dates it uh, quite a lot, um, called In Memory, which was first devised in 1997, and he updated it over the next decade. Uh, Nicolas de Cressy, meanwhile, has been described as the mad genius of French comics, perhaps best known for his vast, sprawling work, The Celestial Bibendum, uh, de Cressy's style is kind of anarchic, surreal, psychedelic, but also incredibly precise and beautiful. And you can just look over his, even if you don't speak the language, you can just kind of take his comics in, 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 a, in a wonderful way. And his stories are fantastical in, I think, the best sense of that word, in that they use the lens of the strange and the uncanny to expose the weirdness of our own world. And also worth highlighting here is the fact that um, they're working in very different periods, and it's periods in which the catastrophe and the end times are dealt with in very different ways. So Marker is working in the 60s in the era of Cuban Missile Crisis, um, whereas de Cressy is dealing very much with global warning, uh, global warming that shapes his vision of a future ice age. Uh, Marker. His work is kind of always, always obsessed with this idea of nuclear annihilation. And that's where Le Jeté starts. Um, the story begins with a simple statement. This is the story of a man obsessed by an image from his childhood. And it is this attachment to a specific memory, the face of a woman watching a man as he is shot, that leads, to a, group, that leads a group of scientists in the future in the post-apocalyptic future to select the man to travel across time to secure the resources they need to uh, rebuild civilization. From this starting point, we are introduced to the ruins of Paris in a sequence that uses photos from Dresden, Hiroshima, and other bombed out cities of the Second World War. We then follow the man as he meets and falls in love with a woman he had seen as a child. She calls him her ghost, as he seems to appear fully formed at different moments in her life. They wander the streets and gardens of Paris, the man seemingly in awe of the teeming life he suddenly finds himself surrounded by. And J.G. Ballard actually called this the only convincing time travel in the whole of science fiction, which I think is a wonderful review. And all of this is told completely in still images. Um, and these are actually a couple of pages taken from Marker's uh, own archives in the uh, Belgian film archive. So he pieces together the whole story just from photos that he has taken. Uh, and this use of photographs creates a sense that all that remains after World War III are fragments of a narrative, 
traces and scraps rather than the whole story that film typically suggests, although this is debatable in itself, of course. And then these images are paired with a kind of poetic narration and a soaring classical score that sometimes seems, seems at odds with the sparseness of the visuals. The certain themes surface time and again, a sense of ruination and the brokenness of the past, these kind of broken statues appear throughout, um, the inescapability of time, the way it holds us and shapes us, and the power of memory, or at least certain memories, to anchor our lives. As the narrator suggests at one point, nothing sorts out memories from ordinary moments. It is only later that they show themselves to us on account of their scars. Other things the film is, um, it's a callback to Vertigo. Chris Mark was very explicit in his love of Hitchcock's Vertigo, which was made, I think, four years before. And this is most uh, noticeable in a scene where they go to look at some tree rings um, in a garden, and the man and the woman are staring at it in a direct echo of the same scene in Vertigo. And the man um, points to a space beyond the tree and says, this is where I come from. And speaking about this moment, Janet Harbord, in, in her book on the, uh, on the film, says, uh, Legete is a view of what the present will look like from there, the future. It is, in a sense, an othering of the present, a making strange of its objects, people, thoughts and landscapes in order to bring them into view, to provide a frame through which the ineffable present may be described. This brings me then to one of the most significant sequences in the film. The man and woman, um, we're never given their names, visit a natural history museum where they are surrounded by ageless animals, which is also translated variously as eternal creatures or animals without age. So I'm just going to play a little snippet of that. Can you hear that? I'll let it play, actually, as I speak. Um, so the stuffed animals here are lifeless, immobile, dead, but so are the two main characters, at least when seen through the medium of the still image. Their lack of movement seems to signify their own mortality, that they are part of this museum, not just its audience. Although the characters perceive themselves as alive, the inescapability of time and the force of narrative means their deaths have already happened. Um, and Brian Dillon wrote about this in a short essay in The Guardian that Marker's camera frames them as if they were themselves dusty specimens trapped in the museum's vitrines. Uh, so there are many fascinating things to draw out from this sequence, I think. When they reach the museum, the, nar the narrative, as you heard, describes it as the bullseye. They are able to walk freely in this time to explore it at will. We might see the museum then as a space of refuge and mooring, a place where the couple are no longer buffeted by the forces of time, memory and narrative, the relentless flow of the present. But it's also very much a space of death. The lack of movement appears to align with Adorno's observations on the unpleasant overtones of the word museal, which describes objects to which the observer no longer has a vital relationship and which are in the process of dying. They owe their preservation more to historical respect than to the needs of the present. I think this really resonates with the themes of the, with the, themes of the film. So Marker is clearly working with both of these dimensions at once. After the end of the world, the museum may be seen as a space of refuge and of freedom, but it also reminds us of our inescapable mortality. As the man later realises, this is a bit of a spoiler, there is no escape from time. The whole film, in fact, documents this loop. Um, I just wanted to show my own version <laughs> of this from a trip to Bristol Zoo a few years ago, <laughs> uh, where the stillness of the visitors seems to see... I actually took this photo, yeah, about five years ago at Bristol Zoo. Does anyone see this? Like, display of dinosaurs at Bristol Zoo, brilliant. 
Well, it looks as if the, the, because the dinosaur and the people are still, that once the shutter has moved on or finished, that both are going to start moving again. And I, find, I found this so weird when it came out. It's actually an analog picture. Um, so Marker's film asks a lot of questions, but one that I think is particularly relevant here is highlighted by Catherine Lupton in her analysis of the film. What will the future make of us when we have become its past? As Le Jatier suggests, it is only later that actions and moments seem to make sense that they reveal, reveal themselves as scars, but these scars also signal a form of rupture. We only ever work with fragments, never holes, never complete narratives. So this brings me very neatly onto my second text, Glacial Period. And our story here opens with a team of archaeologists exploring a lost continent thousands of years in the future when much of Earth is covered in ice. The party consists of uh, squabbling human egoists, so nothing like real archaeologists, <laughs> and a small group of genetically modified pig-dog creatures trained to sniff out the remains of the lost metropolis they believe is buried beneath the ice. So tiny, tiny clues inspire them in this quest. This fragment of a football shirt, for instance, emblazoned with the words, straight for the goal, acts like a talisman for one of the archaeologists although he is chastised by another for handling scientific data in this way. And eventually, a few members of the exhibition stumble upon the edifice of the Louvre, which seems to grow from the ice to meet them. Once inside, the story shifts from one of discovery to one of interpretation and analysis. And we see two main approaches taken here. The first is that of the humans, who use the paintings they uncover to piece together, to, together a narrative of the rise and fall of this past civilization. Over five incredible pages, de Cressy recreates dozens of paintings from the Louvre's collection, reordering them to create a new history of Europe, one in which humans and animals actually live together and, and kind of work together, with an entire culture built around the image rather than the text. It's also here that the various paintings of nude women lead the archaeologists to surmise that they are dealing with a civilization perhaps best described as a veritable collection of erotomaniacs. The second interpretive approach is found elsewhere in the museum, where one of the pig-dog creatures, named Hulk after one of our gods, finds ancient sculptures and artifacts that have come to life and who duly tell, their, tell him their own stories. The exhibits themselves are far from reliable narrators here, however, each having their own perspective depending on their place in the museum. Hulk, meanwhile, has been genetically modified to include a carbon dating option in his sense of smell, <laughs> but this tells him absolutely nothing. There is simply too much information, too many different times, too many different histories. And I think that this is meant to echo de Cressy's own experience of the Louvre. As described on the dust jacket for the comic, the artist was overwhelmed by the collection. He felt, he felt small and ignorant in the face of such riches. How can we possibly hope to understand the stories individual objects might tell us, Glacial Period seems to ask, let alone the amassed history of millions of things? These two approaches, the human and the non-human, can be read as wry comments on the fallacies on which we build our knowledge of the past as well as processes of curation, interpretation and visitor experience. In one memorable uh, passage, the objects describe how the audience has changed over the course of the 20th century. They started out as skinny intellectuals and they ended fat and happy. But this is also a subtle analysis of the way images and objects themselves store and transmit knowledge. If they could speak, would we really understand them any better? Do they know themselves, or are they in fact equally withdrawn from full comprehension in a kind of speculative realist sense? We see this most clearly at the end of the story, when Hulk leads the objects out of their ice-bound prison by somehow, it's not clear, it gets very weird here, uh, getting them to combine into the shape of an enormous wolf, which then bounds off into the sunset, breaks out of the ice and bounds off. It's quite mad. Uh, the human protagonist, on the other hand, unable to decipher and commune with the objects in the same way as Hulk, is consumed by Rembrandt's skinned ox, which we are told has been crying out in agony for millennia. I'm not quite sure how to interpret this. <laughs> uh, but I don't think I can do better than this attempt on the comic book blog Consequential. 
I guess the moral of the story is that if you approach museums with flexibility, openness, and a sense of wonder, you get to ride out into a bold new life on a transcendental post-structuralist magic <laughs> art dog, whereas if you're all po-faced and strict about it, you get eaten by an angry beef monster. <laughs> Um, so I think we see two very different approaches to the museum here which kind of speak to different moments of how museums are analysed and interpreted in heritage and museology. Um, in one we're kind of dealing with uh, a space of res refuge but also of death and then in another we're dealing with the untamed chaos of the collection and the fragmentary narratives that we constantly reassemble around things from the past. Um, I've got to end there, but I just wanted to say that I think that this ties in quite nicely to a lot of issues that are coming up at the moment around the post-apocalypse and the end of days. Um, and there's a lot of writing that's happening at the moment about this. In particular, uh, Roy Scranton had a book out this year or last year, I can't remember, called Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. Lovely jolly read. Um, where he's talking very much about the need to build arcs and build museums and build all these things which we'll be able to rebuild, uh, kind of rebuild civilization from. And I, for me, that's just a totally wrong attitude to museums and what museums are for. I find it utterly bizarre. Um, but we also find this kind of understanding in the Anthropocene that our legacy is going to be something that we don't want. It's radioactive, it's mineral, it's plastic. We have no control over it. It's inherently untamable. Um, and I think that that makes the museum of the post-apocalypse quite an interesting place. That's it.